Hi, hi, hi. So here's the scoop. Every single one of you is making history. Because I study and I share history as my job, what I learn every single day is that the most important and interesting parts of history are not actually what happens in government seats or on thrones. It's the things that are going on with everyday people throughout history. That means you guys. So in your neighborhoods, in your grocery stores, in your homes, and even in your actions, interactions online. That's where history lives. And every single person's story is a valid and important part of the historical record. Now, you have probably heard the phrase, history repeats itself. That's because there's merit to it, even though it's cliche. And here's the thing. Are we really learning anything from the history that's happened before? It's a little bit easy to lose track of the fact that some of the things we think are mundane, everyday happenings are very similar to things that happened in the past. And if we look at them and compare them, we might get some pretty interesting learning out of it. Because one day, future historians are going to be looking at us and wondering what we were doing. And this can be really daunting. It's hard to accept that long after you are dead, there are going to be people judging your actions. But that is the responsibility of being someone that is a part of living history. I'm going to give you a few examples of how we are repeating history today and how looking at the past might make today a little bit better. OK, margarine. Uh, this is a very common thing. It's on every supermarket shelf. It's easy to find. It's actually a French invention. It was invented in the 1860s when Napoleon III wanted an alternative to butter. It was a little more shelf-stable and a lot cheaper. Uh, the French did not really embrace margarine, but it made its way across the Atlantic to the United States in the 1870s, at which point the dairy industry got a little panicked because they were afraid that consumers were, of course, going to gravitate to something that was cheaper. And they were also worried that because it was a cheaper item than butter, that margarine was going to be sold fraudulently packaged as butter. That actually happened. Uh, and so the dairy industry formed this coalition against the adulteration of butter. And as part of those actions that they created under that coalition, they lobbied. And they also got pretty litigious about how margarine could function because they were looking after their business interests. So there were laws that eventually became enacted. Margarine was taxed, and how it was labeled was very carefully regulated, and how it could even cross state lines because some states had different rules about it. And in some cases, the color of it was mandated, including pink. So if you ever want to have a fun Google afternoon, look up pink margarine. This all sounds funny, right? Like, I've chuckled over it many, many times. But to the people living through it, it was actually pretty serious. These three guys in particular did hard time. <laughs> uh, the guy on the right was charged with crimes against butter, butter found guilty, and spent time in Leavenworth. The other two guys got charged for margarine smuggling. The guy on the bottom left actually did two terms in prison. So this is very real stuff. They probably didn't think of it as historically significant, but it is. And today, we have reached a point where plant-based proteins are finally challenging the beef industry in a way that they never have before. And the beef industry is having a lot of those same concerns that the dairy industry once had over margarine. They're worried that consumers might accidentally buy something that's labeled as a burger that is not beef, thinking it is, and that perhaps even they might like it more and their livelihood is being challenged. Now, there are, in more than 20 different states, bills being introduced that will significantly change the way that plant-based proteins could be labeled. They basically don't want them to use any meaty words on the packaging. So, obviously, that means the word meat. But also things like burger, and hot dog, and sausage, and patty, and even jerky. None of that. Now, in 150 years, how is this all going to look to historians who are trying to figure out what we're doing today? They may actually find it a little bit sad, because a lot of the resources that are being fought over are dwindling. So they may look at us almost like the musicians that played on the deck of the Titanic. Like, why were you fighting over plant-based versus animal-based? We can't even get animal protein anymore. We'll see how that plays out. The next thing I want to talk about is actually a bit of a gear change. It's white flight. So in the 1930s and 1940s, and for several decades after that, as the black population in US industrial cities increased, white people left, and they went to the suburbs. This is sometimes called a triumph of racist social engineering. That's a phrase I borrowed from the amazing author Ta-Nehisi Coates. And at the same time, these redlining processes started. This is something that the US government did. 
They took maps of cities, and what they did was they graded them, color-coded them, and showed you which neighborhoods were desirable and which were not. And the ones that are outlined in red, predominantly black neighborhoods. And what that meant was that black citizens could not get mortgages, they couldn't get loans to buy their own houses, which cut off their means to gain property and increase personal wealth. And that also meant that those neighborhoods lost out on a lot of infrastructure. Nobody wanted to fund their schools. They didn't have a lot of businesses that wanted to move in because everybody thought it was hazardous because a government map labeled it that way. And this is something that shaped cities and that we are still trying to deal with today. The ramifications of this are not fixed at all. But I'm going to switch gears again, because now we are at a point where California is kind of under a microscope. California is our most populous state. Because of that, everyone wants to study how its population shifts and changes, and it's reported on all the time. It's very clickable. And one of the things that gets reported is that conservatives are trying to leave California, because they think if they move somewhere else, they might have more like-minded neighbors. That is definitely happening, but the thing is, California is a vast place, and there are a lot of factors going into what is now being labeled as a significant slowdown in the, in the, country's, or in the state's population growth. So there are big financial issues going on here. Housing, I'm sure you have heard, in California is so expensive that middle-income families cannot afford to buy anything there. They certainly can't afford to live there long-term in many cases. If someone is single or if they are a couple and they decide that they want to start a family, for a lot of them it makes more sense to take the money they have and move to another state where the cost of living is lower. And what that means is not only are those people leaving the state and decreasing the population, but the children they have are also not going to be born in California. All of this is a really complicated series of motions. At the same time that these things are happening, there are also some of the wealthiest people of all time moving into California. But when historians try to tease apart the reality of what was going on here, the trick is going to be figuring out which of these stories they might uncover on the way. And if they only get certain angles on it, they're going to have a really hard time figuring out how much of this shift in population was partisan-based, how much of it was financially-based, how much those two things were overlapping and interacting. Now, because this is the kind of thing that I do in my job, I am super duper grateful that I am not going to be one of the historians that tries to figure this particular situation out, because it is a lot. I'm going to shift gears to our third example. This is my man, Louis XIV. Um, I love Louis XIV of France uh, for a lot of reasons. He's one of history's most fascinating figures, in my opinion. And he was also very conceited. He thought himself pretty much a god. And as a consequence, he developed this vision of how France was going to live up to what it meant to be ruled by him. And part of that meant that he wanted France to become the epicenter of style, of culture, and to be seen as really powerful and wealthy. And one of the ways that he did this, his sort of fake it till you make it plan, was that he took a lot of the national treasury and he put it into building Versailles, which started out as a muddy, gross hunting village. Now it is one of the most opulent palaces in the world. And he even hired an up-and-coming gardener who was famous at the time, a master gardener named André Le Nôtre, to design the vistas so that they would take people's breath away when they entered into the, the garden areas. And the reason for all of this was because he wanted visiting dignitaries to see this amazing thing he had built and to be like, wow, France is really, really powerful and stable. Like, I want to be an ally with them because they got money and stuff. Uh, and that absolutely worked because they were allying with him. And at the same time as he was promoting all of this idea of opulence, he was also launching military campaigns to expand France's borders. And he was using statecraft to make deals with people and expand France's power. It worked like a charm. France became the dominant power in Europe during this time. And even now today, when you think of France, you think of culture and art and beauty, and that was all part of his design. But the problem arose that he didn't live forever. It turned out he was not a god. Uh, when his great-grandson, Louis XV, took the throne, he maintained that level of opulence. Like, he had grown up that that was part of how you reign. But he didn't have the same clarity of vision that his great-grandfather had had, and he was not as good and decisive when it came to making decisions. And as a consequence, he ceded a lot of the territory that Louis XIV had gained, and he lost a lot of France's power. And while he was a very popular king during his reign, by the time he died, France's coffers were empty. 
Now that meant that Louis XVI, Louis Auguste, who was the grandson of Louis the XV, follow along, uh, <laughs> he inherited a big fat mess. And bless his heart, he was not ready to rule anything. He really did not have the skills to run a country. And so all he knew to do was to continue the opulence and the artifice. It is why his wife, Marie Antoinette, became known as Madame Deficit. She was spending money they did not have. We all know that this story ends in a pretty disastrous way for the French monarchy. Now, I'm pretty confident most of us are not running countries. If you are, go you. Um, but I'm also pretty confident that most of us have some sort of social media presence. And I'm not gonna dog on social media, I love it. But we all sort of inadvertently have borrowed a page from Louis XIV's book, where we often kind of put our best foot forward in an effort to conceal maybe what we're trying to get together on the back end. Like we don't all have it together yet, but that's fine. And I'm gonna throw myself under the bus here. So uh, on the left side of this image is a beautiful plate of freshly baked bread. I made that bread, I'm real proud of it. Uh, made excellent sandwiches, I gotta tell you. And so I was so pleased with myself that I took pictures of it and I shared it on social media. I put it on Instagram, I put it on Twitter. People lauded my bread baking skills. I will give you that recipe later if you want it, it's amazing. Uh, but on the right is what that counter actually looks like. It's a mess. Uh, <laughs> when I'm not hiding it artfully behind a cookbook page and with careful cropping, there's a lot of clutter. And by the way, I don't have kids, this is just how I live. Um, <laughs> I have droids charging on my counter and toys from the Haunted Mansion. I don't know why you wouldn't, but you know, whatever. And the important thing is I'm gonna clean that counter eventually, so it's not really any big crime. And I'm telling a little fib and showing it in its best light when I'm showing you my bread. We all do this kind of thing. There's nothing to feel guilty about here. However, what I think we have lost track of is the fact that we are all accepting a certain degree of artifice when we interact with each other online. And that's fine, but sometimes we lose track of it to the point that the bar moves a little bit further and things get a little faker along the way. And soon people start representing lives that they're not actually living. We all kind of turn into Louis XVI. And that's not really a problem for most people. They don't take it to extremes, but some people do. And the thing is that we have reached a point where you don't have to look very far to discover that a lot of people who claim to be influencers are up to their eyeballs in debt and sometimes going bankrupt, trying to represent a lifestyle that is just not realistic and is not anything they can maintain. Now in 150 years, what is all this gonna look like? Will historians, who probably will have the digital record as their primary source, be able to tell when we were fibbing just a little bit versus a whole lot? Will they be able to figure out how our ideas of what reality was shifted and what was acceptable in representing ourselves shifted? And moreover, will they wonder why we pay more attention to people on YouTube than we do to city council members? This is all stuff worth thinking about. Here's the thing. I am not here to tell anybody what to do. We are all living our best lives, I hope. Um, but the thing is, I think if you think about your own participation in historical events like these, big and small, you start to realize that the choices that you're making every single day are like sending little letters off to the historians of the future. And you become aware that those choices and those messages are telling them what life is like today, you actually gain a great sense of agency. You realize that you're writing history, and that's important. But what I really love is that it's likely to lead you to make better choices. When you realize that the places you live and how you live your life and how you tell people about how you live your life and what you buy at the grocery store, all of that is really important, you start to gain this real sense of pride. And I think if we all recognize our place in the historical record in this way, we all kind of rise up just that little bit to be a little bit better about it, we can actually build a much better present. And consequently, we're gonna leave those historians with a much better future. So it's not only gonna make their jobs easier because we're being a little bit more truthful, but I have a feeling that they're gonna thank us for making the effort to look back, learn a little bit, and hopefully do better. Thank you so much for making history with me here today.